So today we've got a lot to go through, so we'll be hitting the book of Numbers. We're going to be hitting some pretty interesting and difficult concepts today, and so uh, let's kind of jump into it. Uh, Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. Let me just read this to you, and, and it's regarding this interracial marriage, interracial dating. By the way, I realize in our culture now is the interracial thing is not a big deal in our culture, uh, but it has been in the past at various times, and it has been in the past for ancient Israel. So here we are in Numbers 12, and it says, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife. Now what is a Cushite wife? The land of Cush is generally uh, said to be the land of Ethiopia. And what color are folks from Ethiopia? Black, okay, from Ethiopia. And so Moses' brother and sister, Miriam and Aaron, both older than he was. I remember his older sister when he was a baby and getting floated down, his older sister taking care of him and things. Aaron, his older brother. And so Aaron and Miriam began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Now, some people think that's Ethiopia, that Moses had remarried. Do you remember that his wife took off on him after the uh, circumcision of the son? His, his wife disappears from the narrative. Some people think she went back home and that Moses remarried someone else, and it was a Cushite that he remarried. Other people think that this is Zipporah, that in other words, Miriam and Aaron had not really met Zipporah very much, and therefore they were upset because she was a Midianite. Now, she was Jethro the Midianite. She was a Midianite, but Midianite can be cast as Cushite. Cushite's a bigger category. Midianite is like a tribal name. So it's possible this is Zipporah. Uh, in either case, I'm going to suggest she's dark-skinned, okay? And that, that that's part of the issue here. And so uh, Cushite definitely, I mean, is Ethiopia. They say, has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked, and hasn't he spoken through us? The Lord heard this. And at once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, come out of the tent of meeting, all three of you. So the three of them came out. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud, and he stood at the entrance of the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam, and both of them stepped forward. And he said to them, listen to my words. And then let me just see if we've got this. So what does the Bible say about this topic of interracial marriage and Moses and his Cushite wife? So this kind of sets it up. Um, but then God switches this discussion here to their prophetic function because Miriam and Aaron are challenging Moses. And the Lord said, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. How does God reveal himself to a prophet? In visions, and he says, I reveal myself to him in visions, I speak to him in dreams. So are we going to see the prophets dreaming dreams, and are we going to see the prophets in visions? What's the difference between dreams and visions? Dreams are at night when you're asleep, visions are what? When you're wide awake and you see a vision. Okay, so those two, and that's how God deals with prophets. But then notice what he says here. I reveal myself to him in visions. I, reveal, I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face. So God says, with prophets, I use dreams and visions. But with Moses, we go tete a tete, pene al pene. We go face to face. Is that a pretty big statement about Moses? Is Moses a unique prophet in like the Bible, really, that God goes to him head to head, face to face, and stuff? With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And so Mo God rebukes Miriam and Aaron for what they did. Now, this raises another question here, and I want to suggest to you that there's kind of an ironic justice here and there's kind of some irony here. And the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. And when the cloud lifted above the tent, there was a cloud came down, the cloud lifted above the tent, there stood Miriam leprous like snow. And what you say, Hilbert, why do you say that's ironic justice? Here's, here's my take on this. Miriam gets upset with Moses' black wife. And God says, Miriam, you like white? Miriam, you like white? 
okay, I'll make you white, Miriam. I'll make you real white. And turns her skin leprous, white as snow, okay? And so I think there's a play on this thing here. God says, okay, you like white? I'll make you solid white, man. And, and she becomes leprous. And so I, I, I just take that as a humorous thing. Okay, irony, whatever, however you want to do that. Why wasn't Aaron struck with anything? Aaron doesn't get it here. And some people have said, why does he pick on Miriam? Is it possible Miriam was the main spokesperson? It's possible Miriam was the main spokesperson, but is it also possible that what's the problem with Aaron getting leprosy? Aaron is a what? He's not just a priest, is Aaron the high priest? I mean, he's the man, right? Aaron's the high priest for the nation and stuff. If he gets leprosy, uh, that's, that's no good. I mean, it's affect the whole nation and stuff. So Miriam gets the leprosy, and Aaron, you know, is kind of in a certain sense thought off the hook or whatever, but he's rebuked, actually, by God. But anyway, so this is just a passage with the interracial marriage, and so what I'm saying is be careful about condemning interracial marriage. Uh, Aaron and Miriam did it, and it was pretty serious, the consequences God got on their case. Now, there's a verse I skipped here, and I want to kind of raise it. I skipped verse 11, chapter 12, verse 3. This verse is used to show that Moses did not write the Pentateuch, okay? That Moses could not have written this verse. In chapter 12, verse 3, it says this. In the midst of this conflict between Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, you get the statement, now, Moses, now, who's writing this? I'm suggesting that Moses is writing this stuff. And here's the statement. Could Moses have written this? Now, Moses was a very humble man. Ow, Moses is writing. Now, Moses was a very humble man. Uh, is, 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 does something strike you about that? that that's like, and people have conflicts with They said, how could, how could Moses write that? Is that a very arrogant statement? Now, Moses was a very humble person. By the way, what is the nature of humility and what is the nature of pride? Pride, very easy. Is pride easy to see in somebody else? Is it easy to see pride in somebody else? Is it almost impossible to see in yourself? Okay? Pride is very easy to spot in somebody else, very difficult to see inside yourself, which means then that if you're dealing, if the pride is an issue, are you going to discover it yourself? Probably not. What do you need to help you? Yeah, now here's the religious answer, the Holy Spirit, that's a good answer. Do you need a friend? Would a friend be able to tell you whether you're proud and arrogant? Would a friend be able to see it in you? Once upon a time I asked my wife that question. It's the last time I asked that question. <laughs> she told me the truth. Does she know me? Yes, she does. And she just basically, I was thinking, you know, we have this wonderful loving relationship. She'd be kind and gentle and stuff. She pulled out both guns and bam. <laughs> that was the last time I asked that question. Uh, but what I'm saying is, is, it was most likely if she got it right, can she see the contours of pride and arrogance in me? The answer is yes. So I'm saying is, do you have to have ears to hear of good friends telling you stuff and you know what I'm saying? So be careful about pride and humility. Now Moses writes a statement. Now Moses was very humble. Is it possible for a humble person to know that they're humble? I, I suppose that's possible. Then let me read the rest of the verse. Now Moses was a very humble person. More humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. <laughs> you say, oh, Brett, it's okay. He could know he's humble, but more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth? You've got to be kidding me. Is that an arrogant statement? Now you say, well, God told him to write it, and so he just wrote it down. Okay? All right, so, so how do you work with this verse? Some people would say that Moses could never have written this verse, okay? This verse doesn't come from the pen of Moses and things. Uh, it would be odd from the pen of, pen of Moses. Is it possible that Joshua could be writing here? By the way, is Joshua going to finish the book of De Deuteronomy? Where, where is Moses at the end of Deuteronomy? He's dead. From what I've been told, it's pretty hard to write when you're dead. So Moses didn't write the ending of the book of Deuteronomy, as Joshua probably wrote the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Is it possible that Joshua went through these narratives and, and made comments at points? And so, by the way, is it very possible that Joshua could have said Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth? Is it possible that Joshua would have looked up to Moses and Moses was like his mentor and things like that? So that, that's a very likely statement from the, book, from, from the person of Joshua. 
So that's possible. So that, and by the way, the NIV puts it in brackets. The yeah, NIV puts it in brackets just to say, hmm, may have been an insert from Joshua or something like that. Here's another way to look at it. So could a humble person write this? We've asked that question before. Is humility really the issue? Is humility really the issue? He's being attacked by his brother and sister. Is humility really the issue? I'm not sure humility is really the issue. And there's another way to translate this. This word oni can also be translated. Another way of looking at it is to translate it not humble, but that Moses was more oppressed. The word that's translated humility here can also be translated oppressed. Let me read this verse like this now with the word oppressed in there instead of humility. And the word can mean either thing. Now, Moses was very oppressed man, more oppressed than anyone else on the face of the earth. Could Moses have written that statement? Yeah. Moses is saying, the people of Israel are on my case. I'm sick and tired of these people asking me for food, for water. I can't take this. The people is one thing. Now, my brother and sister are on my case. And so now even my own family is doing this to me. And so Moses was feeling more oppressed. And, and so if you take it in the sense of oppressed, then it fits Moses and it fits the context here really well. And so to be honest with you, I like that translation. Now what's the problem? If your NIV, your NRSV, your King James all say humility, and Hildebrand says oppressed, which one's right? Yes. <laughs> Somebody's saying, oh, let me see here. Uh, no, um, actually, you realize Dr. Wilson did part of the NIV, okay, and Wilson's never wrong. And that's, no, that's just about the truth. That's the honest truth. But um, what I'm saying is I get to back off. So I'm saying it, it can be translated humility. It is translated humility. But I, I've seen an um, article out and stuff where the guy goes for oppressed, and frankly, the guy convinced me. So I think it's oppressed, but I could be wrong. You know what I'm saying? All the other translations go humility, so i got to have a little humility here myself and back off. But I do think oppressed fits the context better. So you see what I'm saying? So I give it about a 60-40, okay? You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying this dogmatically. I think, I think it's probably right, but it's, it's very... I could be wrong too, but I think I, I like it because I think it fits the context better and, and that kind of thing. Okay.